It's good to see so many of you here. Um, what we're intending to do this morning is to tell you something about the work that we have been doing over the past year and also look forward. Um, I'm joined this morning um, for the presentations by Robbie Pearson, who's our Chief Executive, and Suzanne Dawson, who's the Chair of the Scottish Health Council. Um, I'm also joined, and I'd like to welcome Jason Leach and John Burns from Scottish Government, who will be leading the question and answer session after the presentations. You will also hear from Duncan Service, who's our employee director and a member of the board, uh, who will talk to you about the work of the Partnership Forum, and also by Nancy Burns and Chris Sutton, who will talk about the work of the Clinical and Care Forum. Warm welcome to all of you, and we look forward to having conversations and discussion, both in this formal session and um, during the, the breaks in the morning. But before we move into the presentations, we'd like to show you a short video highlighting our work. Welcome to Healthcare Improvement Scotland's annual review. We exist to lead improvement in the quality and safety of health and care for the people of Scotland. This is how we're delivering those improvements. Here's our medical director, Dr. Simon Watson. So we've got a very broad remit and the best way to describe it is in terms of the important questions that only we as the National Improvement Organisation can fully address. So the first one is how good could care be? And that's something we do through our various evidence functions. And then of course we go out there and look in the real world how good is care? And then the next step is to apply all our knowledge around improvement to say how can we help the system bridge the gap between those two things? And rather than looking at those questions through one narrow lens, we make sure that we have the voice and the perspective and the experiences of the people delivering care, and most important of all, the people receiving care, right at the middle of all of that. And we focus all of this expertise, first and foremost, on making sure that care is safe for people in Scotland. We have a relentless focus on safety and assurance. For example, our safe delivery of care inspections help identify quality issues in an NHS board. We can then work with the board, offering bespoke support to make the improvements needed. We want the people of Scotland to receive safe, good quality care that is informed by the experiences of patients and the public, like Gareth, a patient representative on our Excellence in Care programme board. I think it's very important that these voices are heard. Ultimately, they are the customers of the healthcare being provided, and only through meaningful and open dialogue can that service be reviewed and adjusted to ensure that the very best of service is provided every day to every single patient in every hospital throughout Scotland. We provide practical support to ensure people get the right care in the right place at the right time, like Jerry, who is receiving care through our Hospital at Home programme. The level of care that you get is, it's hard to describe, but because it's one-to-one, -one, uh, I think that whatever you're given as drugs or whatever else work better because you're in a happy place and you can't do better than that. We're also providing support to help improvements in primary care, like helping people access GP appointments more easily. Here's Dr. Savannah Irving, GP at Perth City Medical Practice. Um, I think there's always some challenges when you're trying to do a test of change um, because you know that there there might be um, an issue or, or a problem but you know when, when we're very busy and trying to meet a lot of patient demand you can sometimes become possibly a bit entrenched in the appointment system that you have or you just feel that it's not a good time to, to change. 
and you're, you're sort of putting a Band-Aid over, <laughs> over an open bleeding wound type thing, I think we decided this was the, a, a good time for, for us to, to do the test of change. So we just went, we just sort of put our heads down and just did it, um, which I think was really good. And, and Healthcare Improvement Scotland helped us with that because it's the, the type of program that they run. It's, it's a short program. So it's a, it's a seven week sprint. And that means that, yes, it's, it's a lot of work, but you put the work in and then you can look at the results at the end of it, which is super, super helpful. All of this is underpinned by evidence and intelligence, work that makes us a trusted source of advice for health and care professionals. The National Guideline on Stroke we collaborated to develop, chaired by Professor Martin James, is just one example of the advice and guidance we can provide. Really, uh, the evidence and consequently our recommendations are really pointing to bigger doses of rehabilitation therapy uh, and more intense treatment for patients because we know that leads to better recovery and of course in the end more people uh, recovering their independence after a stroke. And the most important piece of evidence? People. Like the children and young people who helped develop our Bairns Who standards. As project manager Rachel Hewitt tells us. Since 2018 we've worked with the Care Inspectorate to jointly develop standards for a Scottish banner house known as Bairns Hoos. This wouldn't have been possible without the children and young people that have worked with us from the start. They've told us what's important to them, they've been brave, and we've listened to them. And these standards are a testament to that. I'd like to thank them from the bottom of my heart. Looking ahead, we will take what we have learned from our achievements and put this into action. We remain steadfast in our commitment to support the recovery and renewal of the health and social care system and to drive the highest quality care for everyone in Scotland. I hope that gave you some flavour of the work um, that we do and hopefully it, it's prompted uh, a number of questions for later on. I think you can hear from, from those contributions that our role is to improve health and care for the people of Scotland. We know that our frontline colleagues do amazing things every day. And it's our job here in Healthcare Improvement Scotland to help them and support them to do those things and, and to encourage them to offer better and safer and more sustained care. Over the past year, we've continued to provide support for a system that is not only in recovery, but is also very much under pressure. There is still the lingering impact of COVID combined with a tough financial environment and winter pressures mean our health and social care system faces a range of very complex problems. We know that the answers are not always straightforward and neither are the solutions. And we think we are in a unique position to look across the system, as our medical director described earlier, and ask some key questions. And because we have this national focus, I, I think we can raise and have discussions with people which, which are helping them to improve quality and safety of health and social care. We can identify the connections and the opportunities created by a system-wide working. And we can draw on the skills and expertise of our staff in his, as well as staff out in the wider system, to collaborate and deliver genuine, impactful improvement. But our focus is not just on safety, it's also on good quality care. The level of care that everyone deserves, no matter where they live in Scotland or where they seek treatment. Res resilience and renewal are key, not just for the system, but for the staff, both our staff within Healthcare Improvement Scotland and staff out in the system. They need to be supported to do their jobs to the best of their ability. And through renewal, we hope we can establish a new normal for health and social care to help them work better, smarter and more effectively. This commitment lies at the heart of our new five year strategy, and we have five priorities as laid out in our strategy. First of all, to enable better understanding of safety and quality of health care services 
and the high impact opportunities for improvement. Assess and share intelligence and evidence, which supports the design, delivery and assurance of high quality health and care services. Enable the health and care system to place the voices and rights of people and communities at the heart of improvements. And I think you'll have heard from the video and you'll hear later on from, from Suzanne how important listening to people engaging with communities is. And finally, to deliver practical support that accelerates the delivery of sustainable improvements in the safety and quality of health and care services. And I make no excuse for continuing to emphasise um, both safety and quality in the system. And in the coming year, we will continue to implement our strategy, focus on using our strengths and resources to secure positive and sustainable change in the health and care system. We know that the road ahead is challenging um, and requires a lot of work and effort right across the system. But we can assure that, that our efforts will remain focused uh, in, in delivering and helping supporting people and really making a difference and an impact so that we can increasingly ask the so what question. I'm now going to hand over to Robbie to talk in more detail um, about implementing our strategy. <coughs> Okay, thanks very much, uh, Carol. And um, again, just to echo my thanks uh, that Carol shared there about people being here today. We've got a lot to share and a lot of success. But I think the important point is how the evolution of the organisation as well uh, in the context of the challenges that the system faces. And one of the things I'm going to emphasise in this presentation is the increasing importance of agility, our relevance, but also that multidisciplinary approach that we have as an organisation. And the organisation I joined in 2012 is a different organisation than it is in 2023. And crucial in, in that is a recognition that the problems facing the system will not have one single response. There's increasing recognition that it's about leadership, it's about the culture, it's about the capacity for improvement. All these things come together. And the unique strategic advantage we have in healthcare improvement Scotland, in Scotland is the fact we have it in healthcare improvement Scotland as opposed to in separate organisations, CQC, NICE and others in England, for instance. And I think there's a strategic advantage in that and then how we respond in the context of the strategy. And as uh, Carol made a reference here, we don't make any bones about safety. And safety is fundamental. It's a fundamental thread through our strategy going forward. And we know from the World Health Organisation that, that at some point, one in ten individuals will come to some form of harm when they access healthcare. So safety hasn't gone away. Safety is absolutely central to what we do as an organisation. And what is crucial in this, and through all the things in the relentless focus on quality and safety, is that we use the knowledge, the insight, the improvement that we can deliver, but increasingly from a multidisciplinary point of view. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment in the context of NHS Ayrshire and Arden. And the other thing I'd want to emphasise in this slide is about evidence and how in a tightening fiscal environment and also in the context of that with money but the workforce that we need to make the right choices. Um, and increasingly evidence is there to inform that and I think we've shown some fantastic multidisciplinary work, multi-organisational work in the context of innovation in Scotland and healthcare improvement in Scotland working with the Centre for Sustainable Delivery and many other partners helping to ensure when it comes to innovation it is evidence-based and informed. And then the final point I would make is about quality and the quality and availability of healthcare. And we can't shy away from that in the context of the pressures facing the system, which are the toughest it's been, I'm sure, in many of our careers. And the importance in what we do in that regard is a matter of judgment, it's a matter of uh, importance, but it's also increasingly important in not just the commentary we give, but the support we give to the system when it is under pressure. Now, the first example I want to give um, uh, before I get to, to that is about the four priorities and how we're going to demonstrate that um, under this presentation about the system under pressure, the system being able to recover, the, the use of evidence and practice, but also and support for the system in the future. So against each of those four, I'll say a little bit more about what we are doing. And it touches on the video um, that you saw and some of the examples within it. But we just start then with a system under, frankly, relentless pressure. Um, I want to give you this example about NHS Ayrshire and Arden. So we inspected Ayrshire and Arden, um, the, the hospital at Crosshouse in Kilmarnock, in May 2022. 
And there were some significant concerns in relation to aspects of culture, aspects of leadership, um, some very practical issues in, in relation to the delivery of care and how difficult it was in a very pressurised environment in that hospital. And I have to say the leadership in Ayrshire and Arndt responded extremely positively. They recognised that there were challenges, but the important point was how did they respond in the system? But the other thing I want to say is about our organisation. What did we do? We didn't just give a commentary. We said, well, what do we do as an organisation in helping that organisation to improve? And so we take in, uh, the time to assemble a small multidisciplinary team with uh, healthcare staffing, improvement, uh, data measurement, to come together to think about how do we support this hospital and how do we support the team to improve. And all of that was an important part of um, helping local systems in the test of our agility and our relevance as an organisation under pressure. So we went back in, uh, earlier this year, in uh, I think it was May this year, and um, we saw progress, quite considerable progress in terms of the work that NHS Ayrshire Arn had done in respect of Cross House Hospital. So that's a significant step in terms of improvement, and it's a test of us as an organisation, not just of the system, because at the end of the day, um, it was Ayrshire Arn that improved. But what we did was we were responsive, it was a call to arms, and I remember being in this room in that conversation, that this was a, an NHS board that needed help. So I think that's the first test of us as an organisation, our ability to respond in the moment in a very much more flexible and agile fashion. So we've seen improvement, quite considerable improvement in respect of the, the, the system and the leadership within that hospital. I don't pretend they're out of the woods. Obviously, it's, it's under uh, considerable uh, stress and strain. But we are seeing improvements which are important and significant for the system and that local population. In respect of the next one, in terms of um, older people at home um, and uh, 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 supporting hospital at home, what we've seen is um, a recognition for us as an organisation about how we support the system going forward. Now, you had a touched on that in terms of the uh, video and the, the commentary there from somebody who has experienced it is that we've seen a significant increase in hospital at home and how we have supported that right across Scotland. So we've gone from seven health and social care partnerships to 21 that are now engaged in hospital at home. We've seen um, a substantial increase in the number of patients being managed. So we now, um, for the number of emergency patients, the number of older patients, it is akin to a bit more than the Victoria Hospital in Kirkcaldy being managed through hospital at home in Scotland. So a very substantial increase. And what we're doing is helping the system to embed that in terms of older people, but we're also ensuring that there's a learning so that the hospital at home as a system is uh, extended much more widely across Scotland going forward. Again, helping the system to manage care in the most appropriate setting for, the, for uh, meet individuals' needs. The other point to make around primary care is that we know that 90% of care is actually delivered outside the hospital setting. And the example from Perth was a very good example about how challenging it is to access general practice. And that in the example whereby um, slots were given for urgent um, care, they were not being utilised and maximised to the best effect. So that patients would be waiting much longer than two weeks for a routine appointment and uh, there was an inefficient use of the urgent slots within the Perth City Medical Practice. And what we asked them to do was do a bit of review, and through they did the seven-week sprint, and we demonstrated through that that we were able to give um, individuals faster access in terms of routine appointments, and at the same time ensuring those that did have urgent needs were seen as quickly as possible. So again, a demonstration that we are supporting people to get the right care at the right time in the right environment, and I think that's a crucial aspect in terms of the primary care improvement as well. Now, you heard a bit about Bairns, Susan, it's important. It's absolutely crucial, not just the subject matter, and I'll come back to why it's not just important in terms of the subject matter, because in terms of children's um, uh, rights and rights in terms of recovery um, and having in trauma-informed practice, we know that um, having the right standard of care is crucial. So absolutely proud of the work of the Evidence Directorate in this, working with the Care Inspectorate, to ensure that what does good look like in the context of um, a much more integrated, holistic model of care for individual children who may be of experienced trauma or may be giving uh, witness statements uh, in respect of uh, 
uh, very difficult and uh, traumatic events. And these standards are important in describing what does good care look like. And absolutely important in that regard is about how the whole system works together in a much more connected way and a holistic way, whether it's child protection, justice, or the health service working together in a much more cohesive fashion. And what we did in providing the standards around the uh, who's was to say, what does good look like? So going back to Simon's point earlier about the questions we asked, what does good look like? And crucially, in the context of finite resources, we've got to be better able as a country to describe what does good look like. And that's where standards by the evidence directorate are crucial. And Bairns who's is an absolutely fantastic example of that, which I'm immensely proud of. But it's also important in standards because what I think is important is that we um, think about how we apply standards more consistently in Scotland, in our system. And how do we do it in a way where we can demonstrate what does good look like? So we, when we visit our hospitals, whether it's infection prevention control, we already know what the standards are in that regard. But as much further we can go in respect of demonstrating that through rigorous systematic standards in the application of them in, in the local system. The last thing I want to talk about is supporting the system for the future. Now, um, around about 63% um, of uh, individuals who uh, are drug users and substance misuse also have a mental health problem. And you have a sevenfold risk of homelessness um, a, if you're a drug user as well. And we already know that 90% of people who are homeless also have a 94% chance of having a mental health condition. So all these things together <clears throat> in the context of mental health and substance use are a crucial aspect of improvement because in 2022 there are 1,051 drug-related deaths in Scotland. Now that's an improvement of where it's been, but it's still far, far, far too many. So as an organisation, we are getting more upstream and thinking about how do we support the system for those that have a dual diagnosis to be supported to remain healthy, to remain accessing the right care, tackling stigma, tackling those issues which prevent them actually receiving good, high-quality care. And I think that's an important point of us as an organisation, not just in looking to the future, but ensuring that what we do isn't just about the health and social care system, but thinking in the context of population health and prevention and thinking about how we support people to receive the right care going forward. So I'm going to hand over to... Suzanne now, um, and, uh, but what I'd like to just um, emphasise in all of that is that the organisation is adapting and changing to the circumstances it faces and it needs to be able to demonstrate its relevance, its agility, its flexibility and added value in a system that is under pressure. And I hope just with a few of these examples and what we're doing is demonstrating that we are connected, not just in the national programmes, but in meeting local needs each and every time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Robbie. Um, it's really great, both through your presentation and through the, the video, to hear how important the voice of patients and the public is in his, his work. Making sure those voices are heard is part of the remit of the Scottish Health Council. We, in fact, have a legal obligation to do it. All of us might think that we know how a patient or a service user experiences a service, but none of us really knows what it feels like from their perspective. That's where engagement makes the difference. It helps us to understand services on a whole different level. So what do we mean by meaningful engagement? If we achieve meaningful engagement, it results, first of all, in a better understanding for making decisions. Like what's needed or the practicalities of how a service might work for individual people. It's about improved relationships between the public and services. About people feeling ownership of the service and wanting to be involved. It's about higher quality, more person-centered services. But ultimately, it's about improved health and well-being of communities. But how do we achieve meaningful engagement? This is what lies at the heart of our community engagement vision. The purpose of this vision is to set out a clear, high-level view of our future. It is very deliberately not about the detail, 
but about setting our direction of travel in a concise way. It defines our aim and purpose, and it clearly describes how what we do is integral to delivering the work of the organisation as a whole. And by that, I mean his as a whole. Our vision focuses on three programmes, which align with the core functions of his. These are evidence, improvement and assurance. And let me just take a moment to provide you with some examples of the work that we're doing in each of these three areas. Evidence, as Robbie and Carol have very clearly outlined, as did the video, evidence is at the heart of his work. We're a trusted source of advice and guidance for health and social care professionals. The opinions of the people of Scotland are a vital part of this evidence. Let me give you an example. Our 11th Citizens Panel survey published earlier this year showed how strongly people felt about the use of digital tools to help share and improve access to health and social care. The findings have informed NHS Scotland policy development and provided useful evidence supporting the development of key work streams such as the data strategy for health and care, the digital health and care delivery plan, NHS Inform and the digital front door. Findings also informed NHS Scotland's thinking on digital healthcare messaging, content and future engagement. This includes thinking about digital inclusion, ensuring that no one is left behind and that non-digital options are made available to those who prefer not to engage in a digital way. The findings will also inform the equality impact assessment Scottish Government is developing in support of the integrated care record. <coughs> Last week, we published our most recent citizens panel report on two subject areas, the regulation of independent health care and organ and tissue donation. And we've just gone back to our citizens panel with our next topics, preferences for accessing health and care and NHS Scotland's climate change and sustainability strategy, with the report to be published early next year. The Sustainability Commission stemmed from a presentation at the IHI Forum in May, when Jason and his colleague Stuart Duncan gave a presentation on sustainability in healthcare with our director, Claire Morrison. Providing evidence from engagement to inform policy is a key part of what we do. But it's also vital that we hear people's voices to improve our own work. That's why we introduced our People's Experience Volunteer role. This is a new role in addition to our public partner volunteers who are embedded in ongoing projects and programmes of work right across his. And some of whom are here today. I see Helen in the audience. Our new People's Experience Volunteer is a different role. They give rapid feedback on specific questions, such as helping us understand how people read reports or shaping questions we might ask as part of our engagement work. We are already benefiting from their involvement and we will continue to grow this role through further recruitment of volunteers across Scotland. Finally, I want to touch on our statutory duties to assure NHS Board's engagement on service change. Our work with boards on assuring engagement has identified two areas of concern and addressing these has been a key focus of our recent work. The first is the assurance of engagement on service changes that don't meet the major threshold but still have a significant impact on people. When the updated version of the Planning with People guidance was published by Scottish Government and COSLA earlier this year, it described the existing well-defined process for major service change, but there is no such process for service change that doesn't meet the major threshold. Many of these changes attract significant public and political attention, but there is currently no assurance of the engagement undertaken. That led us to thinking we needed a new assurance process to fill that gap. What we've developed in collaboration with NHS boards and health and care partnerships is a robust process, but not an onerous one. It builds on existing contact we would have had anyway. And most importantly, 
When everyone is pressed for time, it doesn't introduce any additional reporting. It's about us reviewing what boards would have produced anyway, engagement plans and governance papers in whatever format they are normally produced. The response so far from boards involved has been really positive. They've talked about how it would prov provide assurance that they need for their board meetings and for the public in their area. Our aim now is to shift the focus from major service change to how we can help create good engagement all the time. Only then will we truly hear the voice of the public in all our work. We anticipate having more to report on this in our next annual review. Our second area of concern is around the lack of clarity and what is expected of boards on the engagement they should undertake for service changes decided at a national level. Our work here is under development and again I hope we will be able to report progress on this in our next annual review. I hope through these examples of our work we have demonstrated how we are working to achieve our aim of enabling meaningful engagement across health and care services. Thank you very much and at this point I'm going to um, just show a very short two minute video that just gives you a little bit more of a flavour of um, community engagement and meaningful community engagement within his. Meaningful engagement really matters. We want to make sure that everyone across Scotland can be involved in shaping health and care services. This will make services safe, high quality and focused on the needs of individuals and communities. We will achieve this aim by building and sharing evidence around engagement, using knowledge and expertise to improve engagement, and providing assurance that people have been involved in shaping services in meaningful ways. To build evidence, we will gather public views, run citizens panels, carry out research, share case studies and hold workshops and events. To improve engagement, we will use our quality framework for community engagement and participation, lead networks for professionals in similar roles, provide training, support volunteering in NHS Scotland and share our expertise on equality, diversity and inclusion, person-centred care and public involvement. To provide assurance, we will support health and care services to develop and review their engagement strategies, provide advice on service change and share the positive impact engagement makes. By working together and engaging meaningfully, we can help improve the well-being of communities and create a more inclusive health service for all. Find out more at www hisengage.scot Thank you very much Robbie and Suzanne. Um, I think you've probably got the message about how important we think community engagement is and I think in the current climate where systems are on the pressure and financial, there are financial constraints, it's even more important that we have a well-informed, well-engaged public because there are potentially some very difficult decisions ahead. So we focus, focus quite a lot on external engagement and talking to communities, talking to individuals. But it's also important that we actually, as an organisation, listen to internal voices. And we're now going to get uh, two different aspects of feedback. First of all, I would like to invite Chris Sutton and Nancy Burns to come and give us the feedback from the Clinical and Care Forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll sit, sit down. <laughs> Gonna sit down. We'll sit, I'll start off st standing up. My name is Chris Sutton and I'm the co-chair of the Clinical and Care Staff Forum along with Nancy Burns. I'm a portfolio lead in community engagement and systems redesign and I'm also a registered social worker and Nancy is a portfolio lead in nursing and systems improvement and is a registered nurse. 
And we want to talk to you a bit about our role in co-chairing the Clinical and Care Staff Forum and the, particularly the importance of this in ensuring good governance and good clinical and care governance across the organisation. So we do consider that the forum has a key role in doing this by bringing together clinical and care professionals across the organisation, enabling them to share multidisciplinary experiences and improving the understanding of different professional groups, both within the organisation and externally at a national level. We provide a clinical and care perspective in relation to both corporate and new developments across the organisation. It's incredibly helpful that Robbie attends the, every forum and, for example, over the last year has brought the development of the new strategy to the forum and enabled the membership to comment and contribute to its design and development. It also enables us to provide a clinical and care professional perspective on national policy issues and on various developments, particularly through the involvement of our various professional groups across the organisation, from a medical, pharmacy, nursing perspectives, for example. And we report on a quarterly basis to the Quality and Performance Committee, um, taking various points from, the for from each forum to this committee. So what in particular have we been doing over the last year? We've got a membership of 162 people across the organisation, and on average we have about 50 members attending each forum. We have presentations on three topics at each forum and present on particularly topical issues and items of particular importance across the organisation. This has included over the last year adverse events in healthcare, the whole of our mental health improvement programme, the role that we have in improving the support to unpaid carers within our healthcare system, and our work in relation to excellence in care. It is also over the last year, myself and Nancy have been appointed as co-chairs, and that has given us an opportunity to think about and how we might review the role of the forum. And Nancy's going to speak more to that just now. I think I'm too tall to start. <laughs> anyway, um, so we had an opportunity to reflect. I think being a new appointment, it's really nice to reflect and evaluate um, how we undertake the clinical and care forums. So we reached out as part of an evaluation to all the members and asked them um, to rate um, some of the key questions, but also we set up breakout rooms so we get some rich narrative. And they all kind of agreed, in fact, 86% of respondents agreed that these clinical and care for, uh, forums were really valuable to them. It provided really good connections across the organisation with the people who work there, but also the work that they undertake, but also um, sharing that learning, but also it was useful to see how that work was influenced nationally to support the system. Um, so the next steps where we asked them what would be even better ifs as part of that improvement culture, and most um, wanted to have shorter sessions. So we had two hour sessions, which on reflection probably are quite a lot to get through for people's diaries and their commitments. But they also felt that um, there was an opportunity for more interaction. And that's something we reflected on as well, that they would like breakout rooms so they could have some further rich discussions and better opportunity for alignment to other professional um, forums, but we're going to explore that further and do some more kind of deep dives into how we can make those real improvements. But what it has demonstrated, there's really clear evidence um, that this group or this forum contributes um, to the effect of clinical care um, governance across the organisation, but we feel we've got real potential to strengthen that forum, but, um, but thank you very much for your time. Happy to take any questions. I think we're probably going to store up the questions for, for the next session, but thank you very much. And I think one of the things that, that's really important is we've invested quite a lot of time in thinking about clinical and care governance in the organisation. It's not obvious as an organisation that doesn't deliver frontline services where that, that sits, uh, but we've been wor working really, really hard um, 
to make sure it is embedded right across the organisation and the work that the forum does is very important. So thank you very much. You. Our second feedback is from uh, Duncan Service, who is our employee director and a member of the board. Uh, partnership working for us is very important. Um, uh, we respect the relationships uh, uh, with the Partnership Forum. It isn't always smooth sailing, uh, but it's very important that we actually continue to have a dialogue and discuss. And Duncan, you're going to give us some feedback from the last year. Right, so I'll, I'll move somewhere more into the middle, uh, <laughs> trying to stand in front of anybody. Right. Just here, I think that's probably the best. So, welcome. I'm Duncan Service. Uh, I'm the employee director. And what does that actually mean? Because I think we'll be start with that for those of you, and we'll go on for there. So, I'm a non-executive on the board, but I become a non-executive because I am the staff side chair of the Partnership Forum, and Robbie, as the chief executive, is the management chair. And, and I might become the staff side chair because I'm elected by the trade unions and professional organisations, and that's my role, and that's why I'm here. Uh, but my role as employee director is for all staff. So, we'll, so the things I'll be talking about today are things that affect all staff in partnership working and are based on the staff governing standards, which I'm not going to read out to you, but which are more important now, I would say, in a time of, of change than they might have been when things were going well. Staff are really important and anything that we do both within Healthcare and Improvement Scotland and the NHS in Scotland is going to require change and the partnership forum is about change not about the status quo which I think is what sometimes it gets mixed up with. So to get on to what we, we did have a partnership forum development session in October uh, and we had uh, so we've got we've got some points which were discussed there that I think is worth sharing with the with the annual review. So we have struggled, I think, to be strategic this year because we've been caught up in all the change. So there's been change, organisational change, and change of all sorts of different change. And I think we've really struggled to have the capacity to to listen to everybody and and, and bring their views forward in a way that we would probably have hoped to. And I think that has led to some of our discussions not being as um, is uh, how should you put it? Uh, comfortable, maybe as what they've normally been, because we've normally had more time. We've had more time to think about things. So it's been quite difficult to do things in a pressured environment. And I think it's really, really t uh, made made our um, relationships struggle a wee bit. But despite that, uh, we have actually got some some really quite uh, important things. I think that we, we've managed to do, and things that we're, we're hoping to do over the next year. So we've seen the strategy. So. Um, we, we've, got a, we've got one team, and every organisation's got one team, but I think our ambition is a wee bit, hopefully, hopefully really to take that multidisciplinary bit that uh, Robbie was talking about in some of the examples and, and make that real so we can actually deploy the resources for, of the organisation to where the, the things that are, that are affecting the NHS or, or the wider social care system need, need to be addressed. Uh, and we're doing work in the back down to do that. So we call it one team, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's about being more flexible. It's about people understand what the role is and how you can move to a different role and, and on the back of that we're looking at how we're using fixed term contracts because we need to get away from a lot of very short termism uh, and a lot of admin that goes around that and moving people more agilely to where the, where the issues are. I think other items that I think probably are, are for the future although they're, they're also in the past as well we, but we have, we, we've had an eye matter results which, which are which are good I mean you <laughs> but I think there's always a question why matters about what did you people mean when you answered these questions um, and I think we, are, we, we do want to do some more work about just, just ask, asking them so the, the ones that are in our surveys being lower will be probably similar in, in the NHS but the advantage we have is we have 500 people so we can go and ask some people what did you actually mean when you said that and see if we can actually get, get under it so, so we're, we're, we're committed to doing some work with that and alongside that um, you'll see the, the, the safe to speak up extra the questions in there and people have answered that um, and we're not really sure what that means but we know that we haven't cracked that and we need to get out and, and, and get underneath it and, and what make people more confident about speaking out. Now clearly here uh, we're not seeing issues, you know, we don't have patients here so that it'll be other different things that, are, that, that address it but some, but some people will, 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 will just don't seem to be confident that when they raise issues that we'll be able to deal with them so we need to, to get underneath that. Um, and I think there's a commitment from the whole partnership forum to do that. Uh, but that, that was something new that came into issue as I matter, so we'll need to take that forward. Uh, but you don't have to look far to see why that's important. And then just to sort of r round up about a couple of other items, I think equalities is really important. 
for the Partnership Forum. It is actually one of the staff governance standards. It's not written that way, but it is, it is in there. Uh, and we, are, we, we, we have a, some very active networks, which, and we're trying to make sure that the networks don't feel separate from partnership working. So, so we are working on that. And we've done certainly uh, the... I think certainly the, um, we've done some work on, some work on, the, on the disability passport, for example, the, the race the inequality network's been, been relaunching and is, is, is getting some work done and you don't have to look far for, for, from the COVID days to realise why race and inequality still matter, I'm afraid, in the, in the, in the wider world. Um, and obviously we've, we've done some work on equally safe, safe at work uh, uh, as well, which I think this, uh, might come up later on, but we've certainly done quite well on that as well. Uh, these are not basic activities driven by the partnership forum, but they are part of the wider staff governance work. Uh, so that, that, that was the bits I particularly wanted to highlight, but I think just to say that it's not, we do want to be more strategic going forward, we're very stuck in the, the operational space and we need to be thinking about the future. The future is not, not what happened last week. You know, the world's changing round about us and we need to be much more quick uh, at the partnership forum of, of dealing with things and moving things forward rather than sort of picking up the, the loose ends that have, that have fallen out of it. So that was really all I would say, so I'll sit down, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Duncan. And I think that point you made right at the end about... Um, the needing to look forward. Uh, and it's always a challenge, I think, at annual reviews because the focus is looking back. Um, uh, but we're quite a few months into our new strategy in the new year, so it's trying to balance looking back and looking forward. And, and thank you for your honesty. I think we, there have been a few challenges during the year, and I think uh, we wouldn't deny that. But I think what's positive for the board um, in particular is that, that we've had conversations about those challenges We've agreed that there are lessons that need to be learned from that, and we've also agreed that we need to do that, 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 work, that work together. Uh, and ultimately, it's about you know, improving the organisation, because that then leads into improving things for the, for the wider health service. That concludes the morning session. So you now have an opportunity for a break to reflect on the presentations, to begin to formulate your questions. Uh, Everyone's been very good at keeping to time, so you've got a few extra minutes, which is good. So if you could come back into the room at 10 to, that would be really good. That, that gives you a chance to have a chat with each other, get your coffee, and as I say, start to draft your questions for Jason and for John. So thank you. Thank you.